Hey everybody, welcome to Money's No Object. I'm your host, Dylan Howell. This is episode number 125 of our YouTube channel and podcast. And I cannot be more excited to continue sharing with you guys personal finance topics that I think could be useful for you in your long-term financial life. Today, what we are going to talk about is risk aversion. And risk aversion specifically when it comes to your investment choices uh, and why understanding how risk averse you are or understanding what your risk profile, you've heard me say that before, looks like uh, should impact how you choose to invest your money. It should impact what you choose to do as a long-term investor. And so we're going to talk about that today and really dive into uh, how knowing yourself and knowing the risk that you're willing to take can make you uh, the investor that you are and make you uh, maybe a better investor in the future. Before we get started, though, if you could go down below, hit the big red subscribe button, like this video, leave me any feedback in the comments down below, and I'll be sure to respond to you there. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcast, then be sure to uh, subscribe there and leave me a review on either one of those platforms. Uh, follow me on social media at MNO with Dylan, and that's really good uh, supplementary materials to all the things I'm putting out in these long form uh, YouTube and podcast shows every single day. And then if you need somebody to help you walk through your financial life, somebody to uh, help you to create a plan that is specific to you and your family and keep you accountable to that plan over the long term, I can help you do that. Just go to my website, www.mnowithdylan.com. Click on the Work With Dylan tab and you can choose the financial coaching session type that would work best for you and we can begin pushing towards your long-term financial goals together. So starting from the baseline, what is risk aversion? Well, risk aversion is nothing more than investors preferring less risk to more risk, all things equal. And this makes perfect sense to all of us or most of us. It should make sense to us because, uh, you know, if you are going to invest in something that you expect to pay you 10% and uh, the risk of earning that 10%, uh, maybe it's a 50-50 chance that you end up earning 10%. Well, let's say there's another investment that could also offer you 10%, but there's a 75% chance that you will uh, get the 10% return that you're expecting and only a 25% chance that you will not. Well, obviously you would choose the one with the higher percent chance that you would get the expected return uh, that you thought you would. This is risk aversion. This is all that we're talking about here. We're talking about this idea of we will choose less risk or we should choose less risk over more risk, all things being equal. And so what this means is if you are a risk averse investor, which most people are, we prefer lower to higher risk given the same expected return, which is like what I just talked about, or we will accept a high risk investment only if the expected returns are greater. So uh, if you're talking about two investments, both have a 50-50 chance of returning uh, an expected return, and one has uh, an expected return of you know 10%, and one has an expected return of 15%, you would obviously choose the one uh, that has the 15% expected return because uh, that return, given the same amount of risk, is higher uh, than the other investment option. So that is what we talk about when we are talking about risk aversion. So why does it matter? Why is it important? Why should we understand it? Well, the reason that we need to understand risk aversion is because we need to understand just how risk averse are you? Uh, at what point uh, do you turn into somebody who is not risk averse, but you are loss averse? And these are two very, very different uh, concepts, but we tend to lump them together and I do not believe that it should be so. Because this idea of loss aversion uh, doesn't have as much to do with uh, the you know equivalent risk, so choose the higher return or equivalent return, so choose the lower risk. Loss aversion is a tendency to prefer avoiding losses altogether to acquiring equivalent gains. This is a very popular idea in the field of economics. And uh, what distinguishes loss aversion from risk aversion is that the payoff depends on what was previously experienced or previously expected uh, by the individual. So with loss aversion, it has to do with previous expectations. Risk aversion just has to do uh, with what is going on in the moment. And so loss aversion implies that one who loses $100, let's say, right, will lose more satisfaction than another person will gain satisfaction from a $100 windfall. So uh, in being loss averse, uh, 
uh, as an individual, you would uh, hate your losses far more than you liked the gains. Uh, and so that really differentiates that from what risk aversion is. And the reason that it's important to make these distinctions and talk about uh, the definitions of these two things is because we need to know not only how risk averse are we, but how loss averse are we too, right? How much risk are we willing to take and how much is our level of risk aversion or our level of loss aversion? Because like we said, loss aversion has to do uh, with our previous expectations. It has to do with how we feel when we are to lose money versus gain money, right? How we feel in those particular uh, situations. And so we need to understand that about ourselves in order to make the decisions that we need to make in how we are going to invest for the long term. And when it comes to being averse to risk or even averse to losses, uh, what you really need to think about is, do I understand the investment choices? Do I understand what I am choosing to invest in? Because a lot of people are extremely uh, you know, averse to risk. They do not want to take risks. They do not want to incur losses uh, at all but it's only because they don't understand what they're investing in. They don't understand what they're putting their money in. They don't understand why something fluctuates in value uh, from day to day. They don't understand the type of mutual fund that they're invested in or the index fund they're invested in, or uh, you know, they don't understand what a bond is and, and why bonds do what they do. And they don't understand that why when interest rates rose, the price of their bonds declined and they don't understand those types of things. And in not understanding, uh, you can seem far more risk averse than you actually are. So risk aversion does uh, rely heavily on your ability to gain the knowledge about the investment choices beforehand, get as much information as you can about your investment choices, and then make your uh, choice, make your decision as to what you want to invest in. Uh, because without information, uh, then you could be taking unnecessary risks, uh, or you could be taking far less risk then is what we actually need. And obviously when I'm talking about risk, I'm not just talking about risk of loss, even though that is part of risk. But when we're talking about risk, when it comes to investments, uh, typically what we're talking about is the variation of returns. Variation of returns being nothing more than our volatility. How much do returns vary over time? How much do the returns of one stock or one asset class vary relative to the returns of some other stock or asset class? Uh, and so that is what we're talking about when we are talking about risk, even though uh, this can end up turning into some risk of loss as well. So when it comes to knowing your levels of risk aversion, uh, what you need to understand and what you, uh, you know, likely will see in yourself is that the more risk averse you are, meaning uh, the more that uh, you, know, you don't want to take on risk, right? Then you are going to require more return per unit of risk than an individual who is less risk averse than you. So what do I mean here? I mean, any extra risk that you take, you are going to require more compensation for that extra level of risk than somebody else. And when I say require, I mean, in your mind, in your expectations, you are going to expect more uh, given a one unit increase in risk than somebody else. But the individual who is less risk averse, they expect more risk per unit of return. Uh, they expect that they are going to have to take a little more risk per unit of return and they are willing to do that and that makes them less risk averse uh, than the individual who is more risk averse. And neither one of these is right or wrong. It's just who you are, how you are, and what you understand about yourself. So apart from the risk averse investor, which is absolutely most of us, and we just have varying degrees of this risk averse ideology, there's also the risk neutral investor. And the risk neutral investor is someone who is only concerned about the return, but does not worry about the risk. And so they will invest in something knowing that it has a certain expected return, but they absolutely do not care about what the risk is of that particular expected return. And in general, investors are not risk neutral. An investor may be risk neutral if the investment is not very significant. They may not care what the risk is if it's something small and insignificant. Uh, but you know, typically the investor is going to fall within some level of risk aversion. And so you take an example of a risk neutral investor and you say, okay, uh, you give them the option of, I will take $100 for sure. So you can give them the sure thing of $100, or you can say a 50-50 chance 
at $200, right? So they would say, okay, $100 or 50-50 chance at $200. Well, the expected return on both of those is $100 because uh, you have 100% chance at $100 here, so the expected return is $100. Then here you have a 50% uh, chance at $200, so 50% of 200 is 100, and then you would add that to a 50% chance of zero, uh, and so 100 plus zero is 100. So the expected return on both of those investment options is $100, but they would look at those as the exact same because the returns are the exact same. The expected returns are the exact same. And like I said, risk neutral investors do not come along very often. Uh, and you know, in reality, you don't really see this occurring uh, because what would we all in our uh, knowledge, in our understanding of risk do? We would look and we would say, okay, you're offering me $100 for sure versus 50-50 on $200. They're the same expected return, but there's obviously more risk uh, to the one than the other. I will take the one with the less risk. Thank you. That is risk aversion. That is what we typically are as investors. We are risk averse investors. And then there's the last um, you know, couple of categories of investors. Again, not as common as risk averse investors, uh, not even close. Well, the third category is you are a risk lover or seeker. And what does this mean? This means that you are a gambler. This is most uh, gambling addicts. Uh, they are risk lovers, risk seekers, right? And they want to increase their return, but their happiness, their utility, uh, their joy does not come from getting greater returns. Their joy comes from taking more risk. And uh, this is, uh, you know, something that it does occur within individuals, uh, but the individuals who do this are not really truly uh, investors. When it comes to actually investing, understanding how to invest, understanding that when you're trying to invest, you're trying to minimize losses, maximize gains. You're trying to take the least risk for the most return. Those individuals are risk averse investors. The greatest investors of all time have all been risk averse investors. Warren Buffett is a very, very risk averse investor. Peter Lynch, who ran the Fidelity Magellan Fund, risk averse investor. John Bogle, who created the first index fund, risk averse investor. And that is not to say that they never took risk. Obviously, they all took risk because they are all uber successful individuals, but they took risk within the boundaries of what is the return, what is the expected return on the risk that I am going to take, and then they would make their decisions accordingly. And so let me tell you real quick what risk aversion does not mean, right? Risk aversion, and this is an extremely common misconception, so I don't want you to get confused. Risk aversion does not mean that somebody they that they want to preserve their capital more than they want to make an above average return that does not mean that you are the risk averse individual because there are varying degrees of risk aversion um, but what they're saying is is just you know being any level of risk averse then you don't want to take risk that is not the case um, we know that you can, I am extremely risk averse and I don't have a problem uh, with, you know, putting all of my money in stocks, but there may be another risk averse individual, somebody who thinks in a risk averse way uh, via the definitions we've talked about previously, and they don't want to put all of their money in the S&P 500, or uh, they don't want to invest in small cap indices that could provide higher returns. Uh, so this is not uh, necessarily the case. So in the same vein, then we also need to understand that the risk averse investor is not the investor that is only going to choose to just save money in a savings account. And they're not just the ones that are going to choose uh, certificates of deposit, CDs, which I, we've talked about before. That is not just what a risk averse investor is. And a risk averse investor is not just going to be the investor that uh, just chooses to invest in bonds very heavily, you know, corporate bonds, you know, municipal bonds, treasury bonds, things of the like. Risk averse investors are not going to be the stock investors uh, that just invest in dividends paying stocks because they don't want to take risk and they want the guaranteed income, all this. That does not mean that they are the only people who are risk averse. People do that and they do that out of their level of risk aversion, but that does not make them the rule of risk aversion. That does not make them the only risk averse investors. Investors who are out here 
that are investing in individual stocks and owning small portfolios of individual stocks and putting a lot of money into you know single companies and taking on a lot more individual single stock risk are still risk averse. They still know uh, that they are taking on a certain amount of risk in order to try to make a certain amount of return. That doesn't make them not risk averse because they are choosing to do this type of thing. It just makes them less risk averse than somebody else who may choose uh, a more conservative allocation of their money. But I just don't want you to think that being risk averse one is a bad thing. Risk aversion is not a bad thing. It is normal. It is how we think. We think within the terms of risk aversion in many of the choices that we make in our life. Risk aversion is not a bad thing. You can still make high returns and be risk averse. You can still make good returns on your money and still be a risk averse investor. People do it every single day. And being risk averse does not mean that you don't want to take risk. Okay. Risk averse just means that you are going to compare the amount of risk that you are willing to take with the amount of return that you expect from that amount of risk. And this is how you go about making a lot of your investment decisions. And so then you may ask, well, how do I go about understanding what I should be invested in by my level of risk aversion? Well, you have to ask yourself a lot of questions, run some different scenarios for yourself, uh, and you, it can help you to make these types of decisions. And I'll tell you why. So if you were to take, right, the, and, and this, is a, this is a simple exercise, I think anybody can do it. Anybody with some basic Excel uh, skills on you know, Microsoft Excel could do this type of thing. You could take the returns from uh, a you know 100% S&P 500 portfolio over time. Uh, you can take the returns of uh, an 80/20, so 80% uh, S&P 500, 20% bond fund, and then 60/40, 40/60, 2080, and 100% bonds. Uh, you could take the returns of all of those funds, and you could look at uh, the level of risk or the level of price volatility of each of those uh, types of portfolios over time. And then you can also look at the returns of those portfolios over time. And if you don't just want to look at the price volatility, you could actually start with some arbitrary amount of money and say, you know, okay, $100,000, what would have been the growth? Or $10,000, what would have been the growth of that over time? And track, okay, this is what it would have looked like, you know, month by month, month by month. And just look, and then go, okay, which one would I have been most comfortable being invested in based on a couple of things, based on how much time I had. So uh, obviously, if you're an investor who has you know, 30 years until retirement, uh, you're probably willing to take a bit more risk. And you also uh, want to make sure that when you're running these types of uh, scenarios that you are using a proper time horizon as well. Uh, but um, it's going to be impacted by the amount of time that you have, obviously. Uh, it is also going to be impacted by when you look at the you know, variation in account value from month to month and whether it is you know, much higher here or much lower here, how you feel about your money um, you know, varying in value that much. You're going to you know, have feelings about that. And then you're also going to have feelings about, obviously, the final number. You're going to have feelings about how much the money grew to over time. Uh, and you are going to weigh mentally, okay, the amount that you end up having with the risk that you took in getting that amount that you ended up having. And that, and, and in looking at those portfolios, you should be able to choose one, choose a type uh, that would be the most suitable for you that you feel the best about. And that doesn't mean that you just have to go invest uh, in some of those pre-made types of portfolios of that like, uh, but that will help you to create a portfolio for yourself that is similar in risk, that is similar in uh, the amount of risk that you're taking for a desired amount of return. Uh, because we obviously know, we obviously know that uh, when we are trying to invest, we want to make, because we are risk averse. I'm just going to make the assumption we are risk averse investors. In being risk averse, we want to get the most return we can for a certain level of risk. And um, anything that does not meet that level of return does not meet our standards. And uh, obviously, we're willing to take you know, 
more return for one level of risk if we expected less, uh, but that is far less common uh, than one would think. So um, we need to be aware. We need to be aware of the amount of risk and of the amount of return that we expect from our portfolio over the long term, because that can help us to make our investment decisions. I'm telling you, if you are a, a super risk averse investor, right? You're not going to be somebody who wants to go out and put a ton of money in Bitcoin. Why? Because the variation in price is crazy. The risk associated with investing in it is crazy. Um, and this is something that actually really, really, really blows my mind is that a lot of people who um, think that they are risk averse, right? Or are extremely risk averse, not just think they are, they are really risk averse, will go out and buy a lot of gold because they think that that is the best way to preserve their capital over the long term. But what they don't understand is that the volatility of gold is crazy, right? You could take far less risk and get the same returns. Uh, but the problem is, is that you don't know what you don't know. And I kind of go back to what I talked about earlier in this episode is that not knowing, not understanding what you're investing in and just taking the word of somebody else or taking you know what you hear as common knowledge and just saying, oh, well, that makes sense. I'm going to trust that. Or, uh, oh, that makes sense. I'm going to believe that without doing my own independent research or own independent study of uh, this particular topic. That can lead you into a place where you are taking more risk than you think you are, uh, or maybe you're taking less risk than you think you are, and, or maybe you'll end up earning less returns uh, than you think you will. And that can be extremely dangerous to your long-term financial growth. And so I want you to understand yourself Understand what you're investing in and you'll be able to make good choices as to how you should invest your money, the amount of risk you should take and the returns that you should expect over the long term. Now, your level of risk aversion also comes into play in your retirement accounts. And, it, and when you are retired, uh, your level of risk aversion comes into play as well, because we've talked earlier this week about withdrawal rates and, uh, you know, some people I talked about, some people are forced into taking uh, higher withdrawal rates simply because they don't have as much money saved or they need uh, more money as a percentage of their total assets than uh, you know the normal individual or uh, the more conservative individual would need. And in needing higher withdrawal rates, we talked about you need a higher return to keep up uh, with that withdrawal rate so you don't start chipping away at the principal amount of money that you have saved. But in doing this, you can reach past your level of risk aversion. And that is a dangerous thing to do. Uh, because if you reach for return, right, you reach for that six, 7% return because you need six or 7% per year in order to pull that amount of money off and still have your principal. If you choose to do that, there's nothing wrong with that, but it is going to put you in a position where uh, you are taking on more risk for a certain level of return uh, than you actually want to. And that is not where you want to be. You want your investments, you want your portfolio to be indicative of the amount of risk that you are willing to take. And uh, if you're only willing to take the amount of risk that would provide you four or 5% returns in retirement, uh, then that's what you should be doing. Uh, but if you're getting forced into six or 7% returns because you, know, you need more income uh, than the money that you have, or you didn't save enough for retirement, uh, then that can put you in a tough place. And that just shows you how important it is uh, to end up saving up as much money in retirement as you can because uh, you don't want to be pushed into this place where you will make irrational decisions because you uh, are more risk averse than your investment portfolio is. And not to mention being more risk averse than your portfolio can also push you into a place uh, where you know the first market downturn hits, let's say you're more risky in your portfolio than maybe you need to be. Uh, it'll put you in a place where the first market downturn hits and you wanna go and sell all of your investments, which is obviously the wrong thing to do. But if you are in some investments that are more risky than what you actually need to be in based on your risk profile and level of risk aversion, uh, then you can be uh, in big trouble, at least mentally, uh, because you're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm gonna lose all my money. I don't know what's gonna happen with my money. It can make you very, very, very uncomfortable. And we call this the sleep test, right? Can you sleep? Can you sleep well at night given the money that you have invested and what it is invested in. And again, a lot of this comes down to understanding what you're invested in, uh, but even understanding sometime is not 
uh, indicative of the risk that you believe that you're taking. A lot of people understand what their um, you know, investment options are and will still take a lower level of risk and a lower level of return, which is perfectly fine. They should do so if that is what is conducive to them. But you would always like to be on the side as a risk averse investor of one who can uh, voluntarily take less risk, voluntarily get less returns, especially in retirement, uh, and not have to reach for risk and return, reach for returns and have to take on more risk in order to do so. Uh, obviously, like I said, you want to take the lowest withdrawal rate possible out of your retirement accounts. And in doing so, uh, that would allow you to get the lowest investment returns possible and uh, also take the least amount of risk uh, that you could take and still get the money that you want uh, to have for your retirement. And so that would be the ideal situation within your retirement accounts. Uh, but I know that is not realistic for a lot of people. And some people do have to reach a little bit for uh, the returns that they need. But if you are in a place where you have to reach for your returns, then just understand that um, it may put you in a place mentally that you're not expecting to be. Maybe you need to do a little more research, understand what you're invested in um, a bit better and, and have somebody there uh, to keep you, um, you know, level-headed and not make any uh, irrational moves when it comes to your accounts. That may be one thing. Or uh, you just may need to be an individual who maybe you work a little longer, right? Maybe you uh, do something for a little longer that will allow you to um, you know, build up the assets that you need to take less risk in retirement. Maybe that's where you need to be as well. But the last place you want to be is taking too much risk uh, without any types of, um, you know, safeguards there uh, to uh, keep you from doing something that is not smart. I just want to say this, understand the amount of risk that you take doesn't have anything to do uh, with your age. Okay, there are people who are in their uh, 50s, 60s, 70s that still hold very stock heavy portfolios. There are individuals uh, who are like me in their the mid to late 20s who uh, will, you know, not want to take any risk in the stock market and not want to buy any stocks and, uh, you know, want to be as stock light as possible or as balanced as possible. Uh, and this doesn't make a ton of sense to me why they would be like that. Uh, but understand that it's not just your age. A lot of it is your mindset. A lot of it is your experiences. A lot of it is that level of loss aversion. You know, do losses hurt worse to you uh, than the gains feel good? And that is the case for a lot of people that losses do hurt a lot. Uh, they look at their losses and they're like, man, that is uh, a really, really tough thing to swallow. And then they see the gains and they're like, oh, well, I expect the gains. And so uh, there's like this double standard when it comes to, to gains and losses. But um, you just have to understand yourself. Understand that it is there is nothing preset that can tell you how risk averse you are. There is no target date fund that can meet your level of risk aversion perfectly. Uh, there is no balanced fund that is going to meet your level of risk aversion perfectly because your level of risk aversion is also going to be dynamic because it has to do with your experiences. Because your level of risk aversion and your level of loss aversion is going to have to do with your experiences. It's, it's going to have to do uh, with the past and how you uh, see things based on what you've seen in your life. Because a lot of us millennials have seen financial crises, we've seen stock market crashes, uh, we've seen a lot of negative things occur uh, financially. And in seeing that, that may force us into a more risk averse mindset. I mean, you just think back to uh, people who lived during the Great Depression. They were a very risk averse group of individuals because of their past experiences. They were very loss averse as well because of their past experiences. And so uh, that is a, a very tough thing to get over your past uh, experiences. And if you feel like your level of risk aversion for a certain asset class is not as high as your level of risk aversion for another asset class, then that's perfectly fine too. If you don't understand uh, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, the stock market that well, that's perfectly fine. If you understand real estate, buy real estate by all means, but have your money compounding and growing uh, because a lot of people think of stocks, bonds, mutual funds as super duper risky and all of this type of stuff. And then think of real estate as uh, this, you know, very, very safe place to put your money. And I'm perfectly fine if that's the way your mind is wired and that's the way your level of risk aversion goes. Uh, but whatever you can do uh, to take the minimum amount of risk to reach your expected returns, by all means do it, but understand yourself and understand what your specific portfolio allocation should be uh, and understand that it is dynamic and it will change over time.
So thanks for watching this episode. If you could go down below, hit the big red subscribe button, like this video, leave me any feedback in the comments down below, and I'll be sure to respond to anything that you leave down there if you haven't done so already. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify podcasts, then make sure to uh, leave me a review and subscribe on either one of those platforms. Follow me on social media at MNO with Dylan, and that's good supplementary materials to all the things I'm putting out in these long form episodes on YouTube and the podcast every single day. And then if you need somebody to help you to create a financial plan that is specifically suited to you and your family and to keep you accountable to that plan, I can help you do that. Just go to my website, www.mnowithdylan.com. Click on the Work with Dylan tab and you can choose the financial coaching session type that would work best for you and we can begin pushing towards your long-term financial goals together. So tune in Monday as we talk about dividends and share repurchases and how they have an impact on your investing life. So thanks for tuning into this episode of Money's No Object. I'm your host, Dylan Howell. God bless.